Hey everybody, it is Friday. That means it is time for another episode of SMG Viewers Comments. We're at episode 139. Let's get right to it. Hi Glenn, I know acoustic treatment is important, but how should I apply it to a room? Do I need a professional to figure out where to place it, or is there a way to find out by myself? Awesome videos, keep it up. Cheers from Holland. I've said this a million times, a great resource for acoustics is something called the John Sayre Studio Design Forum. There's a great forum on there, and a lot those guys on there can be extremely helpful, you know? Take some pictures of your room and ask them for some advice. I know some of the other companies out there uh, will basically give you a consultation. I don't think they'll do it for free though, so I'd suggest checking out the forum as a good starting place. But general rule of thumb is you should have traps in the corners. Anyway, that's a very good place to start. Hi Glenn, what is your opinion about straight versus slanted cabs? In the studio, I really don't think it makes that big of a difference. I've got straight cabs, I've got slanted cabs. Not of the same type, mind you, but they all work. On stage, it might give you, a, a slanted cab might get you give you a better dispersion, but that's about it. I wouldn't overthink it too much. If you can hear yourself, don't worry about it. These are the best drums I've heard on your channel, that cracky snare. Thank you very much, Caleb. Um, he's been a longtime follower of the show. Um, this, we had the right snare with the right drummer and the right mics and everything, so everything just kind of fell into place there. Cam's gonna be back on the show demoing some really cool stuff coming up in the near future. You guys are gonna dig it. Hi, Glenn. Every one of us drummers know that the good old Superphonic is the holy grail of recording snare drums, but why? What are the characteristics that make it suitable for this particular environment, and why should I use it rather than, let's say, a Steve Smith cast steel snare drum? Love your contest. Cheers from Italy. Yeah, all the drummers know it, but you guys waited 20 years to tell me! Thanks a lot! Really appreciate it. Anyway, uh, yeah, the Superphonic, it's just, yeah, you mic it up, it sounds good. Uh, it's made out of aluminum. I think that's got a lot to do with it. You know, different woods have different tones, especially on snares. You go from like a birch to a maple, they're definitely gonna have different sounds. Where And different metals have different sounds. You know, a cast steel snare is gonna have a certain sound. A pressed steel snare is gonna have a certain sound. Copper, uh, brass, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, aluminum just have this, has this wonderful attack to it. So you just can't go wrong. And I would highly recommend getting it. And another reason why you should get a Superphonic rather than a Steve Smith is because it's about one third the price. The Steve Smith cast steel snare is very, very expensive. What was the first record you ever did? I would like to hear how it sounded. Uh, yeah, that's not gonna happen. Nobody's ever gonna hear that. And hopefully I'll never hear it again either because it sucked. It'd be nice to have that drummer not show off so much. It sounds super rough and it doesn't sound fluid. That's because you're used to hearing programmed drums and not what real musicians sound like. To be fair, this does seem a little exaggerated, you know, for the sake of entertainment. Oh no, I made the show entertaining. No, not that. What am I supposed to do? Do a 20 minute video of nothing but my hands and I'm talking? Glenn man, how do you go about a bandmate's attachment to broke ass gear? P.S. Thanks for all the info. Thanks to you. I now own a Windsor NA5150. Cheers. Thank you from Florida. Hey, Mike. Um, that's a tough one. You know, I had a situation where I recorded a band early on in my career, and the guitar player brought in a complete piece of crap. And he's, you know, and I'm like, you know, maybe we should try using a better instrument and get some better tracks. And he was like, well, I'm using this, or I'm not playing anything. And I really wanted to say, okay, well, there's the door, you know, amateur hours that way. But, you know, we ma we managed, but it certainly made things a lot more difficult. So, I don't know, get rid of the bandmate. That would be my advice. Life's too short to deal with that crap. How common is it in the recording industry for a band to want to record and mix everything themselves? Like if a band just needed a studio to record in, but could do the rest themselves. Are there studios that would be willing to let bands do this? Thanks. The short answer, yes. If they commercial studio wants to stay in business, they're gonna have to go along with how bands are working these days. When I did the Bias record, we did the drums in one day at phase one and finished the rest of the recording here in my studio. I think that's gonna be the case most of the time with a lot of indie bands. So a studio should not have a problem with that whatsoever. Hi Glenn, I wanna get into the recording industry. Where's a good place to start and are there any schools you would recommend? Absolutely, the school I work with is a place called the Ontario Institute of Audio Recording Technology. I'm actually te teaching some drum classes there. We did that great big YouTuber meetup there last December where we did the Dread Machine song and all that. That's a fantastic place to get started and learn your craft, absolutely. There are some amazing recording schools out there. Uh, SAE in Los Angeles is really great. Edgar Hernandez, he's the admissions guy there. He's a friend of mine, talk to him. If you're interested and you're in that area, tell him I sent you. Meanwhile, a good place to get started is right here on YouTube. Check out some of my tutorials online or you can grab one of my premium tutorials and I can take you through a mix step by step. It's really up to you though, you gotta put the effort in. How do I get a rule number two shirt when I still live with my Christian parents? I can't move out because I'm still in high school and I need that diploma to go to carpentry school. Oh, the irony, the Christian kid wants to be a carpenter, just like Jesus. Good luck with the walking on water bit. Here, that can be a little difficult. 
Seriously though, uh, you don't have to get a rule number two shirt. I do have bases lift and keep calm and blame the bass player. Lots of ways to make fun of them without pissing off your Christian parents. Believe me, they'll get angry about something, especially if it's fun. Hey Glenn, is it acceptable to go to a studio and suggest how you would like your record to sound? Or do you have to let the producer do his own thing? I'll be recording an album next month and the producer I'm going to is the best around, but I don't like how low the vocals are in his previous mixes. Thanks Glenn. Short answer, yes. If you've got a certain sound you're going for, great. Bring some CDs, show him some examples. But if you're complaining about how low those vocals are, um, chances are you're wrong. Because vocals should lead the mix. Doesn't really matter the genre. Hey Glenn, I'm in the market for some new microphones and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the newer high-end budget mics such as Aston, Warm Audio, Stam, and Sterling Audio. I'm hearing some great things. I don't have any of them yet. I know I'm going to be doing a few things with Stam and possibly Warm. I definitely want to check it out. Aston uh, expressed some interest in, in working with me as well. I've heard some stellar things about the Aston mics. My friend Alex Nasla over at Gear Gods swears by his Aston. You really can't go wrong. And that's one of the things I love about the whole technology that's out these days is you can get some really spectacular gear without breaking the bank. And I think that's just amazing. Can we get a shirt that says bass, bad at simple shit? Cheers from Alberta, eh? Yes, yes we can. In fact, I'm gonna put the design up right here. You can get that on the Spectre Media Shop today. Sorry, uh, kid with the wacko Christian parents, they're probably not gonna like that shirt either. Oh well, the rest of you guys, grab yours today. Hey Glenn, I'm a chick in a punk band and a lot of time after the gigs, I'll get a bunch of creepy assholes coming up and hitting on me. And it's not just casual flirting or anything. One guy said he wanted to show me his dungeon. Yeah, what should I do about this? Yes, fuck you, Glenn. Okay, this one's been in the list for a while. I've been wanting to, to answer this one for quite some time. You're gonna take heat from a mainly predominantly male audience. I go back and look at you know what the, the shit the Runaways had to put up with, you know, spectacular band and whatnot. They took an awful lot of shit from their audiences before they really got any respect. And I think it fucking sucks. I've seen friends go up on stage with a female singer and some asshole just sit there in the audience and go, suck my dick at the at the vocalist. And it's like, yeah, like he'd ever had the balls enough to come up and talk to her after the show. But the guy's coming up to you. Here's a great way. And uh, this goes back to the 90s and L7 did this and I thought this was awesome. If you've got a problem with guys hitting on you after the show, do this. While you're on stage, pull out your tampon and throw it into the crowd. Guaranteed no guy will come near you after that. All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Hope everyone has a spectacular weekend. Before we go, don't forget to get the new shirt, Base, Bad At Simple Shit. It's appropriate for everybody except for the guy with the crazy Christian parents. Have a wonderful weekend, and I say, as always, Hasidiga Ibuai.